a lot of the radical left. Actually, if you look at their behaviors and what they say they believe in, that is absolutely unprocessed trauma. A lot of that is borderline personality disorder. You can get stuck in anger, you can get stuck in resentment and stuck in pain and you become aggressive, but you don't mean to. I've lived it, I've lived it. I know what being a fringe lunatic radical leftist is. I've literally been that. Somebody who's traumatized, somebody who's experienced uh, sexual and physical abuse as a kid, who's angry with someone out there who's more powerful than I am. And then you become the conspiracy theorist. It's the structure, it's the patriarchy, it's, I used to write essays railing against um, uh, Western mechanistic uh, uh, scientific perspectives. And I hate, I, I really hated it because I thought that's what had hurt me. I thought that's what had caused me pain and was causing pain all around the world. There's this weird conspiracy out there. I'm victimized. And it's like, why? Who? <laughs> yeah. who? Who's, who's point? Who's doing this to you? Obviously, sometimes that does happen, but it's an obsessive insistence on victimization through a, a, a grand scale conspiracy, which couldn't possibly exist at the scale that they say it does. But it absolves you of responsibility. And that's the point. Hello and welcome to Trigonometry. I'm Francis Foster. I'm Constantine Kisson. And this is a show for you if you want honest conversations with fascinating people. A brilliant and returning guest today is one of our absolute favorites. Uh, he is a man who's done many, many things and he's got a book out which is called A Cult of One, How to Deprogram Yourself from Narcissistic Abuse, which is an area of speciality. Richard Grannon, welcome back to Trigonometry. Thanks very much for having me back, chaps. Uh, it's really, <laughs> you look like you've frozen into the chair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about the book and we'll talk about all this great stuff, mate, but we haven't seen you for a while. How, how's life? How have you been? Uh, good. Busy. Just busy with work and um, trying to sort things out and move forward. Um, I'm, I'm having a few problems with, with YouTube at the moment. Uh, starting to look suspiciously like uh, sh uh, being shadow banned. So I'm going to sort that out. Uh, How? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us. Um, I, you could make a lot of money if you can do that. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's a lot of people who have the same th suspicion, I think. I had, I had uh, the, the, a guy who works for me in conversation with him yesterday, and, and they said, oh, we've reviewed it, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with your channel, even despite the evidence we gave them. Um, I just have to move to a new channel. So totally, yeah, we're going to have to start a new channel and I won't put my name in the videos. So I'll go to my email list and push people through from the list to the videos because it re it's a poison chalice now. And there's, there's just, that's it. Like, it's interesting because our, our numbers have been weird on YouTube as well because when we do a good interview... Uh, with a big name guest, he will do well, not as well as it used to necessarily, but it'll yeah. do well. But if someone is less known or maybe the interview is less spicy, the numbers are much lower than they were, even though the channel is bigger. And on the podcast, on the audio side of things, the numbers are going up every, every month. You're, but on YouTube, it's You're not never recommended to me. I'm a subscriber of yours. I have to actively go and look for you. You're ne uh, there's, there's different people who are in, Douglas Murray. I watch Douglas Murray videos all the time. And YouTube never goes, oh, this guy watches, Doug let's give him some Douglas Murray today. Never, ever happens. You guys never come up in my recommended. I have to go and find you. So they, these are indications that shadow banned or throttled or whatever people want to call it, like there is a bit of jiggery. What did, what did Twitter call it? Visibility filtering? Right. Yeah. That's yeah. You've been filtered. You yeah. have been filtered. You've so. been filtered, yeah. mate. So, so there, is, there is a bit of, there's, there's that sort of aspect of things going on. And I'm thinking, okay, what's... What's the appropriate way to deal with that? What's the appropriate action for that? And, uh, you know, it's got to match the branding and the effort with the project that I'm trying to make and, and all the rest of it. So, yeah, that's that's going to be the big one for next year. Wow, man. So, the book, why did you write it, Richard? Uh, I wanted to get down on paper uh, my experiences that led me to doing the channel as I've been doing up mm -hmm. until now. And... I wanted to also sort of convey the philosophy behind what I teach and have it all in one place. Have it, you know, fairly easy to read, fairly easy to understand. And so I could just say to people, okay, if you've got a question for me, you can find it there in the book. So I submitted an 80,000 word academic style document mm -hmm. to the publisher, uh, the, these gentle Americans. And um, 
they sort of said to me, oh, this is really fascinating. Um, we think it's a little dense. And I'm like, <laughs> it's boring, isn't it? They're like, no, no, it's not boring. It just needs. So they, they then had to re-educate me on how to write a, a book. So they wanted me to do half, every chapter needs to be half an expose of my own life, mm -hmm. anecdotes from my own life. And then you earn the right to teach people something. And I was like, do you know I went to a British boarding school? I couldn't <laughs> possibly share my private life. So I had to go through this process of opening up uh, and telling stories from my own life in the book, which was, in the end, it was fun once I learned how to do it. And what was that process like? And did you learn something about yourself whilst you were doing it? Oh, God, yeah, I learned. I, 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 it was. It became this, it became a therapeutic process. It mm. was, uh, it took, it, at points it was like, pulling teeth it was really hard it was really really hard and the and the the editors kept asking me for more they were like we need more from you we need you to reveal more about yourself and i was like oh god i'm really resistant to this mm -hmm. there's parts of me that i do not want in the public space which like what yeah tell, <laughs> tell us now what you didn't want to say so that was it was but because if you look like uh on the other side of the coin it meant it made me think, oh wow, I'm really not in alignment with the way our culture's going. Because people are rushing to share their private life. Mm -hmm. They can't wait to let you know what they had for breakfast or who they're sleeping with or what color socks they've got on. They'd love to be seen. To, I hate it. I absolutely just it uh it mortifies me. I find it like a really mortifying process. So yeah, it was tough. But that's quite interesting because you are a public person. You know, you're a performer. You're someone who likes to be in front of yeah. camera. You're somebody who likes attention. So that's quite strange, isn't it? Because normally people who are like that want to reveal all parts of themselves, don't they? It it very much was a deliberate persona that was that was created. So I've kept my protection, my psychological self protection, was always to have a public persona and then my private life mm. kept very very separate and it's made uh it, it i think it's made my life easier so you get you see people like they get their twitter accounts banned or cancelled or whatever and they become very very emotional they're extremely emotionally attached to their social media and i'd always look at that and think oh, i couldn't possibly i couldn't feel that way and now i'm realizing it's because they've put themselves in there and it's parts of themselves that are getting thrown away for me it was Strictly business. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the book because I, I think, it, you know, we, we've spoken with you in the past and there's so much more to, uh, you know, often we go for dinner and talk and, and there's so much more that you talk about than narcissism, which is what people will be familiar with you. But we'll start with the narcissism and, and um, I suppose in order to recover from narcissistic abuse, you first need to know that you've experienced it. Yes, you need to have... You need to have a model of reality that says uh, there is a personality disorder called narcissism and this is what they do, not just to me, but it's happened to other people multiple times and it's going on right now. So how do you know that you've been in a narcissistically abusive relationship? Uh, when you find yourself at three o'clock in the morning on YouTube going, why is my girlfriend such a horrible bitch? <laughs> um, and I'm looking at videos where my face comes up and other people's faces in, in the field come up. There's usually a sense of confusion about what's going on in the relationship. Um, and then people will literally, they will put in like, why is my husband so cruel? Why is my wife, is my wife a sadist? Or these are the questions that come up in the Google search terms. And then they filter through to this this area of YouTube, which is just a, a ton of, there's like so many hours of videos now of people talking about narcissistic abuse. There needs to be a sense that something is wrong. And it's not just you know, oh, she has anger management issues or, oh, he's going through a difficult phase of his life. There's a consistent pattern of bewildering behavior here. Mm -hmm. You're stuck in these dead end conversations that leave you feeling, um, it's, it's called cognitive dissonance. It's a stressful feeling because you're being asked to believe several different things that contradict each other at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it creates a feeling of stress somatically in the body. So then people are adrenalized, they can't sleep, they get physical symptoms, and they start obsessively hunting for answers. Mm -hmm. So that obsessive hunt for answers is the first indicator that somebody is probably in an emotionally abusive relationship, at least. Mm -hmm. And what do we mean by emotionally abusive? Because the problem is, Richard, is that, like a lot of words now, mm. at one point they meant one thing, <laughs> and now 
They mean, you know, something completely different. Well, a woman was asked where she's really from, and that was called the trauma and... Sustained race. Sustained, sustained abuse and, and whatever. Yeah. Did you follow this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a woman was asked by... Ngozi Fulani. And she was dressed in full African regalia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And an old white lady said yes. to her, oh, and where are you from? Yes. Because you're clearly representing a country. Yeah. yeah. And that was seen as the most aggressive form of attack. Well, yeah. well, she said it was traumatic. So this, I guess, Francis' yeah. point is yeah. like... You know, you, uh, you might have just had an argument with your partner. Yeah. That's not the same as being narcissistically abused. No, you're yeah. you're pointing to an effect that was identified by a scholar from Brent, Brent or Ghent University, Ghent University, called Jan de Vos. It's called psychologization. And he pointed out the first paper in 2012. It's the effect by which psychology itself has seeped out into the culture and everything is becoming pathologized. Mm -hmm. So there's pathologization where we think everything is a medical issue. And then beyond that is psychologization, but things that are not psychological issues are being rendered psychological issues. So uh, yes, emotional abuse had one meaning. Um, you were with a partner who was abusive, but they didn't hit you. They used coercive control. And now if I say, I don't like the color of your socks, that mm. could be considered emotional abuse. It depends on where the dial on uh, sensitivity is scaled up to. And yeah. that's, that's a part of the conversation that we can't have in a psychologized society because psychology won't go there. Psychology is in its, you know, effectively a very left-leaning field. Mm -hmm. And you can't question the victim mm. because that would be called, we have a term for that as well, mm. victim blaming. Mm. And that is a sin. That's a sin against the orthodoxy that we live under now. So you can't, you basically can't say, something is traumatic and something is abusive, but some things aren't. Because as long as someone claims that those things yes. are traumatic mm. and abusive, you would be denying their pain and blaming them. I think the language they use is you're denying their lived experience. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that actually wasn't the normal uh, stance of psychology for a long time. If you go back, men and women, male and female psychologists for years would push back against that because they would say, well, you're not mentally well. You need objective feedback to know where you're up to. Mm. Somewhere, you know, radical, maybe radical feminism promoted it. Maybe radical feminists got into more of the faculties, more of the social sciences. Postmodernism crept in, Marxism crept in. Um, and yes, it became a case of saying, no, the subjective experience is all important, but only the subjective experience of certain select individuals. And we're not going to tell you who you're going to find out when you're being punished. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a maddening, it's this maddening situation. I, I still love psychology, but it is a mess. It is an absolute mess. But the thing that's bizarre about that is in many ways, when you do that, you're not helping people. No, not so you're making them sicker. I, I mean, it's provable. It's a, uh, uh, what's his name? Jonathan Haidt mm -hmm. wrote yeah. about it in The Coddling of the American Mind. He used Jan de Vos's psychologization and connected it to a concept created by two Australian psychologists called looping. So if you say to somebody, um, you're the victim here and you're sick, by a process of looping, they'll identify with that version of themselves and they'll create more victimization for themselves and mm -hmm. they'll see themselves as vulnerable. Jonathan Haidt's uh, point there was like, look at the generation of kids now. They see themselves as completely vulnerable because of this psychologization. And it's not, I don't think psychology intrinsically should lead this, lean this way. You can have a version of psychology that is much more philosophically robust and you teach people, no, we, the psychologist expects you to be strong. Your counselor expects you to be strong. We don't just... I call it tea and biscuits. Like tea and biscuit psychology is crap psychology. Ah, oh, poor you. Would you like a biscuit? That's <laughs> not going to help. It's not no. because we have to get down to, look, you're an adult. Do you want to function in this reality? This is what you need to do. Yeah. The responsibility must be spread. It can't be offset uh, because that creates an externalized locus of control, which is known to be highly associated with anxiety and depression because you feel like you're not in control of your life. Right. And this is why I feel the timing of your book so great. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I will look forward to doing it over Christmas because I think the timing is right. And you know how sometimes people come along um, and th they definitely have a really good set of things to share with the world, but the timing is not right and it doesn't yeah. work out. Whereas whenever I think about someone like Jordan Peterson, for example, I think yeah. there's a reason that he exploded in the way that he did yeah. because the message was necessary. And I feel the way 
you approach this issue, it's kind of how I've always thought about life as well. It's like, yeah. you could spend your life being a victim. And if I listed all the things that I've, I've, I've been homeless, my family's been destitute, like I can yeah. go on for ages, but yeah. it's not gonna improve my life, right? No. And, and I think that's kind of the message that you're bringing as well, which is, here's a set of steps to actually overcome things that you've been through, right? A hundred percent. And I was thinking of Jordan Peterson, uh, he had this mildly amusing joke when he addressed the Oxford Union and he said, there's there's very, very few right-leaning psychologists in the world. In fact, the only one of them is here in the room with you now, mm. which is is not least because he's actually on the left. But we've had this conversation yeah. before, like as, f as far as the, today's left is concerned, he's literally Hitler. Mm. So, <laughs> so um, but he is that it was that flavor of that type of psychology it's still psychology but it still has its roots in nietzsche and dostoevsky which was you know yeah you're you're on your own in this world and you have to strive and you have to fight which is a more of a if you take a yin yang perspective that's more of a yang approach that's more of a a, um, a masculine principled approach the feminine principled approach would be no, you need top-down assistance from a community to help you. Mm. You need both, mm. like yeah. balance mm -hmm. and everything, mm -hmm. but we've gone too far this way. Yeah. So everything becomes an appeal to authority. If you're in pain and you have a boo-boo, then you have to call for authority. Yes. At least yeah. authoritarianism. That's why you throw soup at paintings yes. to save the climate. Yes. That's why you do all this stuff. And I, actually, I did a debate at the Oxford Union, which they haven't released yet, but this is one of the things I talked about is, like, if you think climate change is a really big problem, um, then complaining about it is literally not gonna do anything. Right. Particularly in Britain, which produces 2% of global carbon emissions. Even if you disappeared Britain from the map, it still wouldn't change anything, right? You gotta, you gotta do something, you gotta create technology, you gotta yeah. have inventions, you gotta pursue that. And we've somehow, as you say, ended up in a position where we just, as a culture, we don't, that's not the attitude. The attitude is big daddy government or yes. this or that. You know, the, the society has failed me, systemic this, structural that. Yes. Yes. Systemic this, structural that, which comes from, I said it's yin principled, which is feminine principled. It comes from feminism. It's a, it's from feminism. I'm I not see why his YouTube channel is not doing as well anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's the birds. It's the birds that's done, done it. it. You, you keep that up, Mr. Granin, and see where yeah. it gets you. Oh, they just, what Jicky's there just turning the dials. <laughs> He's whinging about birds again. Turn yeah. them off. So, so there is, the, like, to me, um, like, being, I would say the left is generally yin principled. It's it's kindness, it's fairness. Yeah. Uh, the right tends to be yang principled. It's competitiveness and it's it requires more resilience. It believes in it. It, it prioritizes it. I think we need balance in all these things. Right. But when I say the cult, or Jan de Vos said the culture is psychologized, he wasn't saying it's psychologized with Nietzschean psychology or Adlerian psychology. He's saying it's psychologized with this. These are radical feminists. Marxist postmodernist ideas that do point at structures that, and the interesting thing is they kind of become conspiracy theorists. Mm. There's this weird conspiracy out. I'm victimized, and it's like by who? <laughs> yeah. Who? Who's who's point? Who's doing this to you? Obviously, sometimes that does happen, but it's an obsessive insistence on victimization through a, a, a grand scale conspiracy, which couldn't possibly exist at the scale that they say it does. But it absolves you of responsibility and that's the point so that's 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 why uh, i think it's gone that way i was listening to uh gabor mate i'm, I'm really getting do you, do you, i don't know if you know gabor i it, love gabor yeah. Yeah, yeah and he talks a lot about trauma and it just made me realize that actually what you see with a lot of people's negative behavior in my opinion is just their unprocessed trauma that yeah. they've never really looked into yes. or never wanted to deal with yes. and then they just go around just vomiting it well, that, yeah, which is a lot of the radical left. Actually, if you look at their behaviors and what they say they believe in, that is absolutely unprocessed trauma. A lot of that is borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to say that. Even Jordan Peterson resisted saying it for the first five years that he shot to fame. He wouldn't. I had a, a friends and clients of mine go to his seminars and ask him and he would refuse to, he would refuse to answer it. He's saying it now. That's borderline personality disorder. Well, the interesting thing about that is in terms of the point you're making, Francis, is it's easy, it's much easier to say because the radical right is exactly the same. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, a, I, I used to be friends with some people, um, 
Anyway, in the movie world, yeah. and there's a brilliant, I think it's a Finnish movie called Heart of a Lion about neo-Nazis. And I met a it's couple- It's a brilliant film about neo-Nazis. It's a brilliant yeah. film about neo-Nazis. I'm a big admirer of many yeah, of the main promotional, characters. Promotional, mate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's why we started the show. <laughs> That's where all the merch is from. Yeah, anyway, exactly. uh, <laughs> but Go to our page. I, I, the actors did a lot of research yeah. f to, to get ready to play a neo-Nazi. And they said that when they met these people who'd been reformed neo-Nazis or yeah. just were neo-Nazis, almost all of them had a certain childhood experience. Yes. Traumatic childhood experience yes. that shaped them into seeing the world in that way, and and that makes perfect sense that like, the people who are out there doing extreme shit, they're probably doing it for for a reason. You know what I mean? Hundred um, percent. The the chances of well, anybody who has extremist views that can easily be challenged inside of a twenty minute sober conversation, at not having some issues related to their sanity, it becomes very very small. So yeah, mm. ra radical anything. Yeah. So yeah, radical right wingers. Again, you'll see borderline personality disorder because they'll be, they're extremely emotionally dysregulated, damages their perceptions. Everything is still an externalized locus of control. You mentioned the Nazis. That was absolutely a victimhood story. Right. Mm. And the all, Jews? It was, it was all one, <laughs> one group yeah. for yeah. everything. And you think, you know, okay, if you sat down, you'd be like, are you sure? <laughs> like, is, that's it. That's your view of reality. You wouldn't even spread the responsibility out. Could you name like five different groups or national? Nope, just one. No, just yeah. Nine. Like we say, like we say in Russian, if if there's no water in the tap, the Jews drank it. <laughs> 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 That's how people think, though. Yeah. Right. You know. And it, it those people anyway. Those those, those people. Yeah. It, yeah. it creates a, an infantile view of of reality, and I think a lot of the problems that we're seeing nowadays is. We're not having adult conversations because people aren't coming from an adult point of view. They're literally not capable of having the adult conversation because they're traumatized. They're stuck in an infantile worldview. The emotional dysregulation turns your perceptions upside down. People don't realize how, how sick they've become. And they crave this ideology because it, it moderates the emotions externally. So they they follow I don't know maybe they become neo Nazis or maybe they become radical leftists or so or or whatever, um, because that makes them feel a little bit better. It stops the screaming in their head for a few minutes. Richard, I'm going to put a counterpoint to you. Isn't it even more different? Aren't Nazis brilliant? Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Make some. They're not all bad. Someone is going to clip that, by the way. Um, but. It's becoming more and more difficult, Richard, to keep your sanity when you look around at the world and what is reality is rapidly, let's be fair, coming undone. Like you, yeah. you just see that the media has been lying to us. Yeah. You saw what happened with COVID. You saw that we were told one thing about vaccines and I'm keeping it deliberately, deliberately opaque because yeah. you know we know what will happen with YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. And now the reality is something else. Yeah. We've been consistently lied to for a long time. Yeah. So can you blame people for distrusting reality? Um, blame. That's interesting. That's interesting. Okay, so to push back on that, I would say that we all, as adults, have a responsibility to... Pro well, you said this point. I'll feed your point back to you. We all have to process our trauma. It's rough right now. I agree. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're seeing more and more people emotionally dysregulated, especially after lockdowns and everything else, surprises me not at all. The The thing that bothers me at the moment um, is it feels like the effort to coerce people's opinions and to move them in a certain direction is being increased. And that largely speaking, people are going along with it, which is, it's it's very worrying. I find I'm pretty worried about where we're up to at the moment. When I, when I last spoke to you, I was much more like... Uh, no, you said, yeah. we, you said we were heading to gulags and genocide. But then the last time we spoke in the in the interview that's gone missing... Yes. Was, oh, you interviewed us. Yes. I interviewed you, you were guys. quite positive. I yeah. was really yeah. positive. We did a great interview, man, and I hope we, we can... Because yeah, something my, went wrong with the hard drive. Yeah, yeah. uh, but you, you did a great interview with us, and I can't wait for people to see that. Hopefully we can get that back, man. Yeah. It was really good. Yeah. Um, Sorry. No, but that being the case, look, what, what, what do you do as an individual? How do you operate in a world where you look around and things, you've been deliberately misled? You've been deliberately misinformed? I don't know. I don't, I don't know what we need. So sometimes I think, you know, I question myself when I say, 
are you, this is Richard to Richard, are you flirting with uh, an, ide- an idea of a narrative that you haven't, that you don't dare to fully realize because it's going to be extremely inconvenient, mm. which at this point would be, I have to become politically engaged. And every fiber of my being goes, oh God, not that. Mm. You, everyone who does that, so no, no disrespect, but like everyone who does that make, kind of makes a fool of themselves in the end because mm. it's loaded with dogma. You say, well, this is the policy by which everybody should live. It's always going to, you always end up look, you look stupid on some issues at some point. And then another part of me says, well, what else is there? Because you have to give people direction. So if you're not going to give them direction politically, what are you going to do? Oh, we use psychology. Psychology is infected. And I've, I've spread the infection. I'm one of the people who popularizes the idea of microaggressions and being mm. traumatized by words. I'm one of those people. What, so what, philosophy? Religion, spirituality, I don't know. I, I wouldn't have the balls to, uh, to to go out there and, and start preaching at a philosophical or spiritual level. So I, I, don't, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm at a loss. Well, I, I think, look, I, I keep saying this in every fucking interview. People are probably going to get as fed up mm-hmm. of it as Francis saying he used to be a teacher. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, becoming a father this year really gave me part of the answer to that. Part of the answer to what we're talking about is family, man. Yeah. And human connection and family connection. Yes. Uh, That answers like 80 to 90% of all this existential shit that people struggle with on a day-to-day basis. It's that, man. It's it's a lack of meaning. It's a lack of purpose. And if you don't have that, it's very hard to be grounded and attached to whatever is the, you know, having my son has completely changed my worldview. And I went from being one of these guys who used to hate parents banging on about their kids. I'm now one of them. Yeah. Mm. You know, I can't help it. But that's because it's added me. I've always been someone who wanted meaningful work and trigonometry is is that for me and always has been. But having family, uh, having children, because they need you. Yeah. And they are vulnerable. Yeah. Right. Mm. So, I can't afford to be needy and vulnerable because there's a small little creature that needs me right now. My wife needs me right now. She needs yeah. me to provide. She needs me to be there emotionally. Mm. And it forces me to get out of my own head yes. and get into the real world where shit needs to be done. And I think that's part of the answer, man. And I'm afraid, you know, people don't like being told this. And I used to hate being told this, but I, I think it's very, very difficult to... For most people, there will be, of course, be exceptions. But for most people, I think without taking that extra step, it's very difficult to be an adult. Like I I look back at me even two years ago and I think I was a mature young person. Mm -hmm. That's that's the best that I would call it. I think a big part of uh, the reason we are where we are is the the plummeting birth rate, the people delaying having children. You know, what do you think about that? I think... Uh, it was predicted by Alistair Crowley, of all people, back in uh, 1901. He wrote a book about this that said we're going to move into an age of infantilism. He called it the Aeon of Horus. Um, and then Jung picked that up, never credited Crowley, and called it the, uh, which was right, the, probably the right thing to do. Uh, he called it the Puer Eternus, which means the eternal child. Yeah. So we now live in the age of the eternal child. And yes, you're probably right. As, as biological entities, we don't fully enter adulthood unless we have children of our own. I don't know if it's a solution to say to people, have kids. Yeah, you're really fucked up. Go and have some kids mm-hmm. to solve that. Yeah, I agree. And there's also, there's going to be, if, because everything is politicized as well as psychologized now, it sounds right wing. Well, having kids. Yeah. Well, isn't that fucked up, though? That's insane, isn't it? It's but, completely insane. But it's, but everything's right wing. The Guardian put did, did an article about why going to the gym is right wing. Yeah, absolutely, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going. But otherwise. it's a funny way of like. If, the thing is, what what all this all that's doing is is it's if if being healthy physically, yes. If being healthy mentally, yes. If having a family and children, yeah. if taking responsibility, if not asking for handouts from the government, if not asking for the big systemic oppression to be overturned, if if all of that is right wing, they're sort of pushing all the healthy people to the right. Well, there's um, there's another uh, uh, Dutton, Professor Dutton, the jolly heretic who, who reviews the evolutionary psychology research, and he says that. I believe him, there's evidence to suggest that 
on the whole, right wing people are healthier and better looking. They have better uh, DNA, better genetics. Right, we need to move to the right. Mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We need to I, stop pretending to be in the center. We have, we've become far right that's, over, that's, in the course of this conversation. And, and, and you, look, you look at that and you think, oh God, I hope that's not true. But I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know what the right means. So what does it mean nowadays if you're on the right? So are we saying that one is life affirming and individualistic, uh, where the other one is kind of life negating and globalist? Maybe, maybe that's the division. Maybe that's what we should be talking about. On this side, you know, humans are bad. We're a burden on the earth. We're a burden on the environment. We're overpopulated. Masculinity is bad. Uh, femininity is bad. Sexuality is bad. All of, all of that, it's like a death cult. And on the other side, you have people who are life affirming and they want to have children and they want to move forward uh, and have a sense of pride and a sense of dignity in their own lives. Is that, we got right and left wing from the French Revolution. Are we still having the same conversation? I mean, it seems like we're probably not. So we're using these terms. I, I disagree with people who say the terms are now meaningless, but we have to see how far warped the world has, has, has gone. This isn't about... So in the French Revolution, it was either you you wanted to keep the royalty and you wanted to keep the church and you wanted to preserve things the way they were, or you wanted to turn everything on its head. So left-wingers are revolutionaries, right-wingers keep everything the same way. This is, this is a little different. And I think there's different agendas that got tagged on um, because they could be. So people who were of the left, based on that point in human history, were open to ideas like globalization, open to ideas like... A population reduction and environmentalism. The notion that we are an evil virus on the world and the world would be better if there were just less of us or none of us here at all, which seems to be like the pinnacle of modern left-wing ideology. The most righteous person would be all humans are trash. Mm -hmm. Just get rid of the whole lot of us. I, that's my humble opinion. That's mm -hmm. if you follow the the dictates, that seems to be where it goes to. So yes, the life-affirming people probably will be healthier and you know, have less genetic mutation, be slightly more intelligent and so on. Hey Francis, what do you think is the best way to advertise a business? That's easy. All you need to do is spend shed loads of cash on an advert that's going to be promoted on a dying medium like TV. Then simply sit back and watch all your hard earned money disappear down the toilet. What about advertising with trigonometry? Why would I do that when I can advertise on ITV3 for the measly sum of 20 grand and be watched by six people? Because Trigonometry now has over 350,000 subscribers across the different platforms and gets 2 million views and downloads a month? That's right. You can place an advert with us and we'll promote your brand on one of our episodes. Your advert will be written by two professional comedians. Yeah, that's right. We're hiring two professional comedians. <laughs> Where we make our ads funny and engaging to the point where some people say the ads are their favourite parts of the show. Yeah, we probably shouldn't admit that, mate. All you need to do is contact us on marketing at triggerpod.co.uk. That's marketing at triggerpod.co.uk. Advertise with us and we'll get your business cancelled. Uh, uh, for me, COVID threw all of this into really sharp relief because I saw two groups of people in when it when COVID happened, there were the people who were just like, well, the government, need, the government needs to support me. The government needs to bail me out. The guy, I need furlough, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And those people who were like, well, I've just got to get on with it. And of course, there's more nuance to that. There were, there were unfortunately, there were some businesses that can no longer operate because of, because of COVID. And, and a lot of people and, couldn't do their job. That's yeah. why they needed furlough because yeah, the government forced them not to. As exactly. Well. But but there was the attitude of of particularly in my industry with, with comedy, in our industry at the time, where comedians were, were saying, well, I, I need to be bailed out. And it's like, well, I understand that your industry has stopped, but that doesn't mean that you can't navigate other areas. Yes. You can't do other things. Yeah. You're denying your agency. Yes, yeah. The, I, we may have discussed this before, but I've always been on, adopted the left, the left wing, uh, largely left wing, uh, argument in psychology, which is that most things in life are due to trauma, the environment mm. and nurture. But with COVID, I really started to see a reaction that I thought was nature based because it was so fast and people were so certain of their position literally within weeks without questioning it. 
and I started to see that split. You said that you were presenting a non-nuanced version of reality, but I would say the response was non-nuanced. Like it was really low resolution. Every largely speaking, people went one of two ways. They either wanted blind submission to authority mm -hmm. and bailouts, or they wanted to fight against authority and sort themselves out. So you just had authoritarianism versus uh, essentially individualism. And I, I, that was so fast. And so I never had any doubts. I wasn't like, oh, but I do like a bit of authoritarianism. Mm. I was like, fuck no, mm. get that away from me. Absolutely not. But people really close to me went all the way the other way overnight. And I thought for the first time ever in my life, I thought maybe there is a genetic component to this. This could be rooted in our biology. Because there were some people who just craved it. Yeah, yeah. And they saw the government, expansion of governmental control yeah. in their lives as a positive. And they and, loved it. And they loved it. Yeah. And they craved it and they wanted more. Yeah, 100%. It makes sense. I mean, one of our favorite, fellow favorite guests is a guy called Stephen Hicks, who's a philosopher mm. and his, a historian. Of I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yeah, yeah, I've listened to him I, before. I'm a big really fan like of his. Him, yeah. And this is one of the points that he made is people who are temperamentally fearful of the future of life, of the world, they don't feel uh, competent or able to solve their own problems. Yeah. It is very natural to those people to then cling towards authoritarianism because of, it, the, 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 in a time of panic, in a time of fear, if you don't feel able to solve the problem, well, someone else has got to solve the problem, yes. right? And who's that gonna be? The government. Yes. And if other people are refusing to cooperate, yeah. what do you do? Well, let's get the hammer out, you know? It, it, to me, I, I kind of, I had compassion for the desire to rely on governmental forces and, and to have that appeal to authority, a top-down appeal to authority. But it was so unquestioning, it made me laugh. I thought people were joking. I was like, why would you trust your government to do that? What evidence do you have that your government is qualified for this? And they go, well, it's the government, just do what they say. I'm like, look at them <laughs> falling over each other like clowns in a circus. Mm. That that's who we're trusting. And they're like, just, just, just there was this stressful response, like, just do as you say, do as they say and everything will be okay. Do as they say and everything will be okay. Stop asking questions. It threatens our survival. It was like we were on a life raft and I was standing up waving my arms. They're like, you're gonna capsize us all. And I was like, I don't see the, that the world is like this. I don't see it the way you guys are seeing it at all, but they absolutely saw it that way. It was, a, it was an amazing, I'm still not fully recovered if I'm, if I'm being really honest. I kind of, I trust people a lot less. I trust institutions far less now. And well, the times we're living through now, every month that goes by, you see more and more reason to be uh, um, d deeply suspicious of what any of our institutions are saying. Which institutions can we trust? You don't trust your church, you don't trust your media, you don't trust your government, you don't trust the police. Who can you trust? If we really lose all trust for all of our institutions, our civilization's moving nowhere. Yeah, and that's something that I think people don't realize when they, you know, they talk in such hyperbolic manner, manners, and you know, they try to put forward this narrative about civil war, and you know, talking about the West collapsing in these grandiose terms, you just go, you're not, doing good here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's a way to discuss these things and these things do need to be discussed, but there is also a sensible way to discuss them without being inflammatory and without trying to polarize people. Yes, I, I think that the leaning towards being uh, inflammatory and, and polarizing, it, it, it's an unfortunate side effect of the, in, the brain entrainment that social media has given us. Mm. You just get more likes. You just get more views that way. Yeah. The more of a dick you are, the more ridiculous statements you make. Um, the three people who are sat here now would have more Instagram followers if we deliberately wound people up every week and just adopted the more polarized view on any topic. Just take the most polarized view and just hammer that view on any topic. You'd have you'd well, triple your This followers. is what I was going to ask you. You talk about not being fully recovered. And I think as a society, we really haven't fully recovered because uh, one of the things... The, there's obviously a thing that exists, which is uh, what on, on Twitter people call, I support the current thing, right. which is the government and the mainstream media saying, you must do this, therefore you must do this. Yes. Yeah. We've now also seen that there is the, I oppose the current thing. Okay. And there's a whole economy of people who are doing what you're saying, which yeah. is going, oh, the government is saying this, 
what would be the very op- oh here we go yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah. and then before you know it you know like and whatever whatever the opposite is of what the government is saying it's always there and and people who literally have and I I saw it with the war in Ukraine yeah because it's something that I know a lot about by virtue of background having family connections speaking the language blah 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 and I suddenly saw these people people I know yeah people who couldn't find Ukraine on a map right having very strongly held yeah. very, very extreme opinions about yeah. that subject. And I think you've explained it perfectly. And guess what? I reckon if Donald Trump had won the last election and he was the one sending money to Ukraine, yeah. it would be exactly flipped. All the people who now oppose it would support it and all the people who currently support it would oppose it. I mean, not all, obviously, but the majority. Yes, and I, I agree with you. And I think that that says something very sad about the state of modern politics. Yeah. So when I was in California and I was I was talking to people there, uh, I, was, I was there at, uh, in October, and I was saying, you know, I was asking around, like, do you, would you vote for Biden again? And they said, yeah, absolutely, we, we would vote for Biden again. What, with no reservation whatsoever. And the attitude that I got and the answer that I got from most people was, I would vote for anybody as long as it meant that Trump didn't get back in. Mm. I was like, Okay, just <laughs> play, play, listen to yourself speak. That's your, your your vote is just to stop someone you don't like from getting in. That's not democracy. That I, I I don't know what you call that, but that can't be. That's not what the voting system was designed to do. I'll just hate my enemies at any cost. It's not. It's not, I want this. I believe in this policy. This education policy is good. It's just screw the other guys. Mm -hmm. and whatever it takes to beat them, that's what we're going to do. That is not a healthy uh, state for politics to be in. No, because it's just built on revenge. 100%. And what you see in our culture, a lot of what is going on is revenge. Yeah. One side does one thing to another side, which is unfair and wrong. And then the other side then does the same thing. And then they start using each other's weapons. Yeah. Like the left started out cancelling people and then the right went, actually, you know what? Yeah. We're going to do the same thing. Yes, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you go, well, okay, but what's the end game for that? Yeah, it, it creates an awful lot of resentment, more emotional dysregulation, perceptions become more skewed. Um, and I, I, again, when I look at this, I think, what is the solution? I liked before what you said. Uh, about family family, family mm. community uh there is a practical solution i could get behind a movement that said let's bring people back together face to face mm. it's england well it's just the united it's cold it's a bit of a pain in the ass but we probably should see more of each other because mm -hmm. we're all in our houses seeing each other through this evil thing that just generates the jungian shadow in you uh you get a very strange view of people out of the world there's not that many extremists actually out there no. they don't live on your road they don't go to your local if you knew the people around you you would probably feel a little bit better plus i suspect that it's just a good evolutionary match we probably just should be sat around looking at each other we should be sat around the campfire at the end of the day just looking at each other and talking and that would probably bring a lot of the stress levels down i suspect so I like and I, I think as well man like whenever we talk about solutions we've all we've all become very uh, extreme left about it in that we, we always think we need a movement and a system and a whatever. Yes. Whereas actually, I think the truth is a lot of the solution to what, you know, people go through life and most people live lives where they experience a lot of anxiety, yeah. a lot of fear about the future, a lot of loneliness, a lot of disconnection. The answer to that is not for the three of us to sit here and devise a system. Yeah. It's for you as an individual, for me as an individual, to go for a walk, yeah. to go to the gym, yeah. to have children and look after them, to to make sure your relationship is happy, to get therapy if that's what you need, because yeah. sometimes that's what you need too, right? Yes. To to put things in place in your own life that make your life better. And then when we come on set here, we can have a, a conversation as people who are emotionally better regulated than otherwise would be. I think that's much more the answer than coming up with a grand, plan mm. i actually didn't realize that i was unconsciously doing that but you're right it is more of a a, a left-wing uh it's an unconscious left-wing response is like there should be a movement why that's an externalized locus of control and all that all that that would do is further infantilize people but i think i'm entrained into that because a lot of my interactions with people are through social media mm -hmm. and they're constantly saying to me do something mm -hmm. and i'm like oh 
maybe I have to do something. But you're right. No, I don't. Why, why the fuck should I do? You do something. Mm. You're an adult. I, like, I'm an adult. What do I know? Well, as people who talk in public or are in public or do things in public, I think that's actually quite a big part of it is just... And, I, and I, I, I'm not using myself as an example. I remember 15 years ago, I, I saw a clip of Peter Hitchens, who I used to think was a right-wing lunatic mm -hmm. until I became a, a centrist lunatic or whatever <laughs> I am now. And he was talking about psychologization of everything. Right. And he said, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the time people now talk about things where the solution is just to go for a brisk walk. Yeah. And I realized I was sitting at home, having spent the entire day in front of my computer, first working, then playing computer games, right. feeling shit. Yeah. And here I was on YouTube listening to Peter Hitchens. Yeah. Why not go for a walk? And I went for a walk and I felt better. Amazing. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> that's the answer. Yeah. And this is, I think, because we've got to a point where we think that thought is power. Yeah. And it's not. Thought plus action is power, yes. or action is power, yes. right? But thought, you can't think your way out of a paper bag. You have to do things, yes. right? And I think this is where I'm really interested to hear what you talk about in the book in terms of the practical steps for people to overcome the, what they've experienced in, in that kind of relationship. So tell us more about the practical steps of dealing with things like that. There's a few things that I advocate for in, in the book. One of them um, is an exercise I came up with for myself when I was, it's years ago, back in 2013, I was living in Kuala Lumpur. I wasn't mentally particularly doing very well. And uh, I formulated this exercise where I wanted to get an objective sense of where I was in the world and how people saw me. So I did like a profit and loss account, put a line right down the middle. How do I see myself? What am I really about? And then I listed, how do other people see me? The disparity between the two, like I had no control or I had a very big gap between what my intention was and how I was allowing other people to see me. You know, I was a, a hundred kilogram fat white guy with a shaved head living in a largely Chinese conservative area and people would treat me with suspicion and they looked at me like a criminal because they were racist. <laughs> because you can't be racist to white people, yeah. mate. Ah, they would have been racist. Yeah. <laughs> if I wasn't gammon, they would be racist. Yeah. But they looked at me like I was a criminal because I kind of looked like a criminal. I was in a place where there, were, there was nobody else there like me. I didn't, I didn't dress very well. I didn't care about my appearance. When I spoke to people, I used a very abrasive style of humor that I thought was funny but it was often a lot of like sexual jokes or violent jokes or things that are kind of a little bit shocking. And I sort of looked at that and was like, okay, I don't want people to see me that way. There's a lot of stuff I'm saying and doing here that is giving people a sense of who I am that's a million miles away from what I care about and what my values are. And getting a hold of that really made a huge difference in my life. Because if you're internally this, but you're you're externally projecting that, the feedback you're getting from the social environment is not congruent with who you are. Mm -hmm. And you end up with this weird sense of alienation from yourself. Mm -hmm. That creates a huge amount of depression and anxiety. There's people that we've been talking about today, like extremists on both sides of the, the polarization politically, who I think, you know, with like a one or two day seminar, you could do work with them like this and just be like, okay, you're, you're very angry about something. What are you trying to tell people? Well, yeah. okay, well, just calmly. Just Can we write it down and then feed it back to them Socratically? Are you saying until they're satisfied that you've got a sense of what they're trying to say? And then just explore the possibility that maybe there's a way of conveying it that doesn't require all this. You can get stuck in anger. You can get stuck in resentment and stuck in pain and you become aggressive, but you don't mean to. I've lived it. I've lived it. I, I know what being... I know what being a fringe lunatic radical leftist is. I've literally been that. Somebody who's traumatized, somebody who's experienced uh, sexual and physical abuse as a kid, who's angry with someone out there who's more powerful than I am. And then you become the conspiracy theorist. It's the structure, it's the patriarchy. It's, I used to write essays railing against um, uh, Western mechanistic uh, uh, scientific perspectives. And I hate, I, I really hated it because I thought, that's what had hurt me. 
I thought that's what had caused me pain and was causing pain all around the world. And you can, if you're stuck there, you can build that narrative. Like if we did a writing exercise, all three of us could write like that. It's not, <laughs> it's not impossible to get into that headspace, but then slowly over time, you just have to look and say, okay, is that true? You know, is the history of the United Kingdom one of colonization, genocide, and slavery, and nothing else, for example? It's just one of those. It's. Uh, I remember listening to Douglas Murray break that down. And when I'm trying to get into that headspace, that's the example I go to first. I'm like, okay, where are the contravening examples? Where do you see the bits and pieces that move against that very simplistic and kind of satiating narrative? It's like eating a big fat burger because it, it gives you everything you want straight away yes england is awful united kingdom is awful white people are awful it's all slow down <laughs> there's a few facts historically speaking that we have to look at oh that's hard i have to think yeah you might you might have to think you might have to look at some things that won't make you comfortable that that will go against this, uh, I think some of these narratives, they're placatory. It's like it's uh, sucking your thumb. You're basically sucking your thumb and going, okay, I feel better now. Richard, do you think as well, let's to go back to narcissism. To me, the conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists and narcissism, they're quite, they seem to be linked yeah. because it's someone going, I've got the answers. Yes. I really know what's going on. Yeah. And you see them all the time on social media going, this thing that's just happened, this major world event, this happened because of... It's about me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You know? Yeah. yeah. And it's like, and I know why this has happened, and it's because of this. And it's like, well, no, you don't. And yeah. isn't that quite a grandiose thing to say, that you are one of the few people who yeah. actually really understands this? Yes, I am a member of the Gnostic Brotherhood of the Illuminati, and yeah. I know the truth. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's very grandiose. And uh, yes, it's fueled by, I think, I think it's called Ideas of Reference, which is it's self-centered. You're basically saying this is all about me. Fundamentally, the narrative that they have behind everything they're saying is, all roads lead back to Rome, which is me. Oh, this wow. is, I am Rome. This is all about me. Um, and yes, there is there is a narcissism to that as well because it's not only is it grandiose, it's riddled with ideas ideas of reference, self reference, but it's delusional. Mm. Like you just said, like no, you don't know. None of us really know. We can look at the evidence and we can hypothesize and we can challenge a whatever the, the, the major narrative is, but not, nobody actually really knows. And where did you get your effing certainty from? And does that serve you to be that certain all the time about every single topic? It doesn't make sense. It's not, I, I, I think that is a, that's a philosophical point. That's where I would say, okay, here I can see a gap in the puzzle and that definitely philosophy goes in there. Mm. Let's learn to think again. Let's make thinking great again. <laughs> but, you know, the Socratic method, let's go back and forth. What, what is your position? Is there any evidence you've ever seen that contravenes that, that opposes that position? Okay, well, you know, let's think in a more nuanced way. Let's learn to think. Whereas what we have now is a screaming mob. And that obviously reduces all, everything becomes low resolution. There's low resolution perspectives of problems and they yield low resolution solutions. Of course they do. Uh, that are highly emotive and, and extremely self-serving. So yes, absolutely, there is narcissism there. And it's also as well, you know, this is the thing that I find depressing, is that if someone says one thing, mm. normally you can see like, oh, you're going you're gonna to think this. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if someone's really distrustful of the government and they think the government is corrupt and they're not being honest, which is a legitimate point of view, yeah. you kind of go, yeah, I bet you're into Bitcoin. <laughs> So these rebels actually become just carbon copy printouts. And, and it's the same other. on the other side as yes, well. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And they all think the same way about a specific set of things. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's like you're saying, we need to actually make thinking great again and by going, well, you can think the government is corrupt and they probably are. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that Bitcoin is going to be the solution. That's really interesting. I'd never thought of it that way before, actually. Yes, you can see... If this person adopts, wow, you could probably create a graph or something for this. Oh, there so will cool. be, and there will be yeah. like, 
I mean, the correlation between people in America who are anti-abortion and right. pro-gun yeah. or, yeah. or pro-masks and therefore pro-tax rises, you know, like, right, right, right. I mean, you One know. thing just trips the well, other. Well, it's like fish and chips. You can't have one without <laughs> the other for some reason. You yeah, know yeah. what I mean? So you're super pro-mask, but you're also super pro-abortion. Wow, that would be, yeah. Oh, sorry, you're super- I'm pro-health, yeah. except for, for yeah. fetuses. Right, right, yeah. yeah. No, I, I suppose- I, so I suppose it makes sense because there's a congruence of values there. Mm. But I also, I also think what you're saying is interesting. It's like we just fall into an archetype yeah. Yeah. because I believe this. Well, I don't have to think then, do I? I yeah. could just ingest, I could just well, empty my it. mind and just That's pop. it. Because look, Joe Rogan, for example, we talked to him about this. He's massively into guns. I think yeah. he's massively pro-choice as far as I understand. I don't know if he's massively pro-choice. He's definitely, you know, not everyone has to align with all issues. That's why I call myself a centrist. It's not because I am in the center of every issue. Yeah. As we've established on some issues, I'm far right. But, <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like there's certain things about which I feel quite strongly to one side. There's issues about which I feel strongly to the left, you know, yeah. decrim criminalization of certain drugs, for example, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you, the, the centrist isn't really a good way of describing that. I'm just someone who wants to think about things on an individual basis as opposed to get a package off the shelf. Yes, and, and I do wonder, like, when it comes to Joe Rogan, if there's obviously a lot of reasons for his appeal, but I think that could be one of them. That could be one of them, is that the guy can be pro-hunting, mm. pro-meat-eating, pro-gun, and then very pro-choice. And in America, that's it's a pretty it's a pretty rare thing. I, I meet people like that. If I want to meet people like that when I go and visit my sister in California, there's a place called Iron Sights. There's a shooting range. It's like a forty minute drive from her house, and that's where you meet that. You can't put them in boxes because they they're Californians. They vote <laughs> this way, but they love their guns, and they will disappear off into the woods if they feel if they feel they need to. They can survive. Um, so there is there is that there. So there's there is a degree of, of of nuance there. And with him, I also think the encouragement to thought, but not in like well, he doesn't have a snotty English accent. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't come from a highbrow perspective quoting different various authors that you're never gonna read because they're hard to read. It's more of that sort of like a guy who took psychedelics and is like, Did you ever think that mm -hmm. maybe and just like, um, that's philosophy, actually. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a philosophical exercise. It's a Socratic exercise, which I think, I think that leads to the, uh, the, the, the broadness of his appeal. It's also as well, I think, you know, but thinking for yourself and challenging narratives and developing your own points of view is going to ostracize you from certain people. Yeah. It just is. Yeah. And I think people are really scared of that, Richard, because we're fundamentally tribal. We we want to be around people. We want to be accepted. I mean, you get the odd person who's like, I don't care, and they're fine with it. But I think the majority of us just want our tribe. Yes. We crave it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there is a there's a biological instinct towards um, conforming, and I think I think that's one of the things that. It's hard to identify in a moment of polarization because you say, well, polarization is a real problem, but it's the conformist element to it. Mm. That kind of frightens me and it depresses me, if I'm being really honest. Mm. I find it quite depressing to see how quickly people will throw themselves into conformity with the party line, whatever it is. We're all going to believe this and I'm going to be very predictable on all my answers to everything mm. without thought. That just, that's not philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's ideology. Something is thinking for you. It's like you've got a brain parasite that's just that's doing the thinking for you. Um, I find that depressing, I think, because of how willingly people have given up their their sovereignty in that sense. Like it's just too hard to think. The world maybe it's something like this. The world's become too complicated. I can't think. So think for me and I'll just chant whatever you tell me to chant. <laughs> just absolve me of the need to think it through for myself. And it has become very complicated, hasn't it? Yeah. I mean, if you think about almost any issue, I mean, climate change is a good example of this. Not, I, I don't imagine among your many talents, you're a climate scientist. No. Neither of us is. <laughs> so when you're presented with um, a certain worldview about that issue, and you are, it's not just a worldview, you are told that there are certain things that must be done as a result. Yes. And then on top of that, you go, well, I, I don't know what's going on. Yeah. I'm not an expert in this area. I'm told that we have to do these pretty drastic things. Mm -hmm. 
And if I don't want to do them, or if I don't necessarily believe this, or if I have questions about this, or if whatever, then I'm a bad person. Yeah. And in that situation, I think for a lot of people, the temptation is to just go, well, this is what we're being told, then that's what we must do. Um, which, look, and this is kind of the point, is there's a hundred other issues like that. You know, we've got strikes in this country. Are they the good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. Yeah. Do you? Does anyone? Yeah. You know, you, you, you can have a view on it, but yeah. do you know? No. And, you know, is technology good or bad the way that it's changing in the moment? It's got lots of positives. It's got lots of down. Do you give your kid a mobile phone? You know, what, all of these questions are really, really complicated. Um, and it, it, I think that a lot of the stuff that we talk about on the show, a lot of the stuff that people who watch our show are dealing with is the fact, as you say, the world is getting very complicated very quickly. And maybe then, maybe then there is a need to to learn to think uh, that becomes quite urgent because we can ask questions upstream of the questions you've just asked, which would be what is good, what is bad. Like if you say strikes are bad, what's the bad? What? Why? And when we say it's good, why is something good? We probably do need that because the larger and more existential and more complex the problem is, the more likely it is to induce submission in the person who's facing it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the climate change one, yeah, I find I find mind boggling. I'm presented with data and I'm told it's absolutely necessary that we must do these things off the back of that data. And I think it's, it's unlikely that you can be certain based on this data that these are the things that are gonna help or that these are the things that are even gonna correlate with it. Correlation isn't necessarily causation as we know so, yeah, the, the climate change one is interesting. Well, even if you accept climate change is happening and you think it's a major urgent issue, the thing that I find very strange is that, as I said, in this country we produce 2% of all global yeah. CO2 emissions. Yeah. So even if we never burn, never release another molecule of CO2 in the atmosphere, it would make no difference to climate change. Right. And yet we are told that we must kill thousands of pensioners with cold mm. every winter to prov to and and then I'm and then and then I'm, and now I'm a bad person. Yes. I don't want to be a bad person. Right. I don't want to be asking the wrong. Qu but but it seems obvious to me that that the solution doesn't match the problem. Yeah. Doesn't solve the problem. Doesn't address the problem. Yeah. And the solution that we are being told we must implement is hurting a lot of people and will continue to hurt lots of people. Yes. Net zero will kill lots of people. Yes. There's no question about that. That's a fact. So even if you think climate change is urgent and a massive problem, why are we being offered a solution that doesn't solve it and kills lots of people? And why am I a bad person for asking the question? And then you go, well, like, how do I think about this now? Maybe the problem is that we have uh, a top-heavy population with too many old people and the whole... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're just trying to find solutions to other problems masked. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, that's where my brain goes to. I have, a, I have a perverse mind and I think maybe there's another problem here behind the problem and the solution, what we should look at is the solution and what the solution does and start questioning, is that the point? That's interesting. See, I, I, don't, I, I don't think about it that way. My thinking is, I think that they, they, it's actually the other thing that you said, which is, there is, and Michael Schellenberger, I don't know if you read his Substack, is very good on this. There is a particular worldview that you described earlier, which is humans are a virus, humans are bad, humans are this and that. And so it's not just we must reduce the population, which I think is what you're hinting at. I think it's much more basic than that, which is we must be punished. We must punish ourselves for the terrible harm. Look, that look, I fully support. Look, look <laughs> who started the Industrial Revolution? Humans. We did. Well, it's not just humans, it's Western humans. Yeah. Uh, right? The worst humans. The worst humans. We did the Industrial Revolution. Who did colonialism? Who did racism? Mm -hmm. Who did slavery? I mean, actually, everyone did slavery. We'll skip over that. But <laughs> Who done a racism? <laughs> Who done a racism? Well, well, yeah, everyone. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, no one anywhere else in the world is in any way racist. We know that. <laughs> who, who, who's caused all these great problems that we're now de dealing right. with? Right. Well, let's ignore the fact that China and India are going to build a coal power station yeah. every two days. Yeah. Well, let's look at ourselves, Richard. Let's look deep into our soul and realize Blame whitey. we have sinned. We have sinned and we must atone. Yeah. And I think actually quite a lot of it is coming from that. That's why the ordinary person sort of buys into it quite often. I, I, I think so. I agree with you. I think there is a, um, undoubtedly a religious impulse to this. Like it is sin and there must be some sort of penance that is paid. Um, 
again, it seems like a, a super low resolution <laughs> proposition to me. Yeah. Like. And it's weirdly, it's weirdly racist via the back door. Of course it is. Because if we're the, it, what it's saying is, well, I don't want to get in trouble. Ah, fuck it. Mm -hmm. White people, white Western people are the only people powerful enough to hurt this world. They're terribly evil. They're the most evil and therefore they're the best at being evil. Mm -hmm. It's still a white supremacism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, but it's like, this is where Slavoj Žižek, when he talks about this, he gets into trouble where he's like, no, I want Native Americans to be able to be evil. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to embrace their capacity for genocide and torture or Africans or, to, or whoever the minority group is because if we own evil, if we colonize evil and make it only our own thing, it's still, it can still be a passive flex. We're the ones who did this. You see all this terrible, and we did this because we were the only, whilst you were, whilst you were in alignment with nature and uh, being at one with the earth, are oh, very nice, you noble savages. We were the ones who did all this damage. It's still a kind of a weird flex in a way. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't buy it. I, I just, I just think, yeah, and it's uh, the, the whole white guilt thing. Like, come on, it's racism. It's fundamentally racism. Uh, you can't, you can't escape that. Structurally, you can't be racist against white against white people, <laughs> and whatever. But like, it's ethnocentrism. We can at least yeah. say that it doesn't. It just doesn't make sense. And it's a form of narcissism as well. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, it's mirror gazing. It's absolutely mirror gazing. Um, and it is like all narcissism, it's rooted in a delusional fantasy narrative that, mm -hmm. that deviates from reality because reality is too traumatic. Reality, you know, when people, when children develop narcissistic personality disorder, it's because they're raised in environments that are far too traumatic for mm -hmm. them to deal with. So they go for the infantile defense. This is an infantile defense to a traumatic reality. Do you have a website or do you plan to have a website? Because if you do, then EasyDNS is a company for you. EasyDNS is the perfect domain name registrar provider and web host for you. They have a track record of standing up for their clients, whether it be cancel culture, de-platform attacks, or overzealous government agencies. He knows about that. So will you in a second. <laughs> Easy DNS have rock solid network infrastructure and fantastic customer support. They're in your corner no matter what the world throws at you. Unless it's your ex-girlfriend. In which case, you're on your own. <laughs> you know about that. <laughs> Move your domains and websites over to Easy DNS right now. All you've got to do is go to easydns.com forward slash triggered. That's easydns.com forward slash triggered. Use our promo code, which is also triggered, and get 50% off the initial purchase. Sign up for their newsletter, Access of Easy, which tells you everything you need to know about technology, privacy, and censorship. And we are a society that embraces infantile behavior. Oh, we encourage it. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, more than, now more than ever before, that's why I think there's a fear of adulthood. There's a fear of responsibility. And, you know, to be fair, it's harder than ever before. Economically, it's harder to be an adult. You know, we're not... This is than ever before? The, than two, yeah, I see you've bought the leftist bullshit, man. Mm -hmm. What, it's harder than 200 years ago? 200 years ago, you'd be sleeping in a factory. Your wife would be sleeping in another part of the factory. You know uh, what I mean? Mm. Can we make comparisons today to 200 years ago? Yeah, okay. You got me there. Do you see what I mean? I do. I'm not trying to catch you out. No, 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 no. But do catch me out. Okay. Because I want to be caught out. 200 years ago, people were just breeding like rabbits because they didn't, they were, we were ignorant. And we didn't read. We would just poke each other. Well, forget 200 years ago. Compare yourself to your grandparents. Is your life easier or harder? It's easy. It was easier for them. It was more rewarding for them to become adults for my grandparents. I am not allowed no. to be a masculine. I caught him. <laughs> no, but this is great. Brazilian jiu-jitsu of the mind. I thought I thought about this yesterday uh, because I wondered if this would come up. For my grandparents, let me present. Let me present it yeah, to you. In the 1930s, so um, they had no choice. They could only. They had a potential marriage pool of about 30 people. Largely, they had to be in the same geographical location. 
My father, my grandfather was a man, rewarded for being a man, rewarded for his masculinity. His masculinity wasn't the bloated, hyperbolic, cartoonish masculinity of steroids and neck tattoos that we have today. What made him, he was a skinny little dude, but he could, uh, he could fix cars. He flew planes for the Navy. He did up houses, worked with his hands. He was a useful, providing man. My grandmother was a woman. She was rewarded for being a woman. She had women's interests. She made um, uh, dresses and did hairdressing for people. They were rewarded by their culture for being a man, for being a woman. When they got married, the greatest stress of their marriage was that she was Protestant and he was Catholic. <laughs> My goodness <laughs> me, could you imagine the, uh, the scandal? Then they, they went to work and they could afford to buy a house. Mm -hmm. By the time he was 35, he had three of his four children and everyone was on side with him doing that. Mm -hmm. A young man today, so we go back to a young man today, can't be a man, can't be masculine, can't chase women. Chasing women is a, like a, a sexual assault. Liking women, well, that's heteronormative. Do you know that you like women? <laughs> but come on, you're, on this part of it, you're exaggerating a little bit. Which, for tiny uh, bit, it was easier for them to become adults. Was my was my premise? I, I accept the premise. I think you're right in that we make adulthood harder now, and people will fear it for that reason. On the other hand, and this is the point I always think about. My take my grandmother. She's 15 years. Well, when she's probably about seven, mm. there's a mass famine where she lives because the government's decided that that's what needs to happen and millions of people starve. Uh, She's Ukrainian. Yeah. The peasants who happen to have a horse, which makes them kulaks, rich peasants, so the communists come and take their horse and deport them to Siberia. Mm. They eventually make their way back and within a few years, Nazi Germany invades and there's a Holocaust happening that involves a lot of the area, millions of people killed, people go off to war and are, are murdered and whatever. And my grandmother, I've told the story before, she and her girlfriends, the main conversation they had when the war ended was, will we ever taste real bread again? That's how they lived. Um, w maybe it was easier for her to, to become an adult, but would I trade places? Mm, that's a, that's a, a slightly different question. Is like you're sort of saying, was life easier before? That, yes. But given that you've made that point, I would like to moderate my premise and say <laughs> there are more barriers to adulthood now. There would be no barriers to adulthood before. There's also more rewards for remaining infantile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's more rewards. Yeah. Yes. There's more rewards, you know. What are the rewards of remaining infantile? Uh, one of them is you don't have to take responsibility okay. and people will not look down upon you for doing it. This okay. is one of the things that happens when you abolish the concept of shame, which is a very useful concept. Shame was a way society regulated people not to- He wants to... people to have kids and he wants to bring back shame. Yeah. He's fully formed right I've wing. Be, I've become yeah. fully right wing. <laughs> no, but, but, but it, it's not that I, I've become- I 1000% agree with you. It's just that society's moved so far in another direction yeah. that yeah. people who want society to still function are right wing, yes. essentially, right? But- <laughs> Am I wrong? From where I sit here today, it's hard for me to argue that. That, I, I don't that. want to be sitting here saying this because yeah. politically I'm not right wing, but on a, on a practical, it's like that. None, none of us are. Well, it's like vote left, live right. This is what they always say. <laughs> okay. This is what they say about uh, middle class people in this country. Okay. A lot of them will vote left, yeah. but if you look at how they live their actual life, they're right wing. Yeah. You okay. know, they take responsibility. They teach their kids to take responsibility, all yes. of this other yes. shit, right? Yeah. So my point is about shame is, Shame is the society's mechanism of enforcing a certain set of rules, yes. right? You take that away, you say, there is no, there isn't, there's no problem with being massively overweight. We must yeah. not shame people for yes. that. Yeah. And emotionally, I agree with that. I don't wanna shame anyone. I don't wanna make people feel bad about mm. a, a condition that they can't deal with, right? Yes, 100%. You don't have to take, you don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to manage yeah. your diet. These things yeah. are difficult. They're unpleasant often, right? Why don't you, just, you know, be infantile about it. Go, this is a thing that's happening to me. Yeah. And society will go, oh, poor little you. Or yeah. poor, poor big you in this case, <laughs> right? And Poor sweating, heavy breathing you. <laughs> exactly, diabetic you. Or, it sounds like a great kid's book, doesn't it? Exactly. <laughs> so, so society will reward you for that. And also, yeah. if, you, if you want to engage in victimhood, yeah. you get currency. You can... 
And more importantly than that, on social media, you get power. Yeah. Oh, you know, we love a bit of power, don't we? You know, yeah. Yeah. You know I, 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 I've been, you know, someone asked me where I'm really from. I can go and do a tour of all the all, all TV studios and explain why. Instead of yeah. being being mature about it and going, this person was probably trying to communicate something reasonable. Let's find out what that is. Let's have a conversation. Yeah. That's what an adult does. Yes. But infantile behavior is rewarded. You're not going to get on TV screens if all you say is, you know, someone asked me where I'm really from. I went, oh, I'm actually from, and we had a nice conversation. Yeah. So you reward that as well. Okay. Uh, doesn't mean I, I, I agree with both of you. Yes, housing crisis, big problem. Uh, that, that, that creates challenges. And particularly now, you know, living standards are probably not going to be getting better. It's going to be a harder time mm -hmm. for young people to find a job and so on. So these things definitely exist. But at the end of the day, if we're sitting here talking about it from the point of your book, and the conversation we're having, there is no other answer. Is that than personal responsibility? Whatever is going on? Uh, there, I haven't found one. There's, there's no other answer that's sustainable. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I hope, I, I suspect that this- I wish there were. I don't want to, even I, I I'm someone who's naturally quite, I, I lean into responsibility. Yeah. I don't want to take responsibility most of the yeah. time. I don't want to think about, you know, we've got this problem with trigonometry, we need to sort out, I, I've got this problem. I, I, I wish someone take, took care of all of that for me, but I haven't found a system that I've been able to make <laughs> make things happen for me. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that's what I need to do, but I haven't found it. So the only answer I'm seeing is you go, what's working? Cool, let's do more of that. What's not working? Yeah. Let's not do as much of that. Yeah. And learn and grow mm. over time and make mistakes and pay for them. Mm. Pay yeah. for mistakes in expensive ways and learn, right? I don't see any other answer. Do you? No, no, I don't. But um, as, as you were talking there, it worries me because you said, well, what you just said was uh, uh, vote left, live right. But then aren't we going to end up so if people do if so in a population of people who do that yeah there'll be the majority will uh, vote left and live left mm. and the appeals to authoritarianism will continue mm -hmm. you're voting for them but you're carrying the burden it's like that john galt well, and Rand yeah, yeah. i'm thing. not voting for them right uh but I i'm just saying in terms of my own life that is the things that I have found to work. Yeah. As for the way I vote, uh, I look, uh, I, I voted Lib Dem and Labour all my life at the last election purely because of Brexit. And I thought the way that, even though I voted Remain, the way people uh, were treated and the way that issue was treated was just completely undemocratic. And that's why I voted for the Conservatives because they were the only party that promised to implement a decision I didn't vote for. But that's what the people voted for and that's why, right? So, and has that made a big difference? I mean, probably not, right? The, the, the Conservative Party isn't the party of personal responsibility either. Okay, so to take just a slightly different tack yeah. on, on that, I'm just wondering now if being reasonable um, is reaching its limits. Like, you're very reasonable, you're very reasonable. But maybe it's the time to be unreasonable. If your enemies are not reasonable, if your enemies are not listening to you, should you continue to be reasonable? You've got a very balanced, quite a kind approach. You who are my in. enemies, though? Who are your enemies? I don't. I don't think I have enemies. I, th I think I have people that I disagree with about mm. the way we should structure society, but they're not my enemies. I don't think. The people I, I think. I think uh, to to a large extent, the Chinese Communist Party and the Russian dictatorship—they're my enemies. Okay. Mm. <laughs> right. What What about people who affect uh, your child's future? What about people who are going to promote transgenderism and? It's my job to protect them from that. Okay. It's so my you, job. You wouldn't consider those people your enemies? No. I don't the, think the, it's a healthy way to do that, Richard. They're not my enemies. Uh, and also, the, the problem is as well, I, 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 I'm, I can buy into the warrior mindset in that, in that thing, yeah. except we're not in a physical war. Like, mm -hmm. if you said to me, there are some people out there who are going to trans your kid, and we need to get the three of us, <laughs> get some shields and swords, <laughs> and go out and deal with them, and if yeah. we do that, the problem will stop. Yeah. Sign me the fuck up. Right. But that isn't the way the situation is. Yeah. Me and you and Francis putting on some swords and shields isn't going to solve that problem, no. right? That problem gets solved in here. It gets solved by bringing people to explain. Ollie London, who was in your chair a week ago talking about how he spent a quarter of a million dollars on surgery to be Korean, yeah. guess what? Found out he wasn't Korean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> right? That's potentially how you solve it. You talk, you explain, you persuade. Okay. Now, is someone who has a very different view of me to me, am I enemy? I don't think that's a useful way. If I thought that was a useful way of looking at it, I would look at it that way. I have no problem with fighting for things mm -hmm. I believe in. But I don't think that's the most effective way of achieving the outcomes that I want to achieve. Interesting. I'd need to think about that. That um, maybe I've been drinking too much of the wrong Kool Aid. Um, I see some some of the the positions adopted, especially where they are deliberate outright attacks against, for example, the family unit mm. or the mm. sexual and towards the sexualization of children. Mm. Um, I view that may, maybe I'm becoming a little more polarized, a little more extreme. I see we all them are. As, yeah. as, as enemies, and perhaps you're right. I shouldn't. It should. And even if they are, perhaps the weapon to deal with that is still reason debate, no matter yeah. whether I see them as, as enemies or not. I think most people, and, and I think it's important for every single person in this room, every single person who is watching and listening to this, mm. to really understand this and accept this. Most people are not bad people. Most people are fundamentally good. They just, as we have said before, they just don't think enough about long-term consequences when it comes to certain things particularly like transgenderism, they get fed a narrative and they, they believe that narrative and then they regurgitate that narrative. I think the problem is if we start putting it and having the mindset of people being enemies, I don't think we're going to... The chance of us healing society is going to become ever lower as a result of having that mindset. I think that the, the best thing that we can all do is try and be in the adults in the room, which is to model good behaviour. Mm, mm. Because even when somebody has a great point, somebody could have a great point, but the moment they lose their temper, the moment they start indulging in tactics that the that their aggressor is using, immediately their their status goes down. Immediately you start to have less empathy for them. I think it's just really important that we try and moderate our language and our behaviour, as difficult as it is. And I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> It really, because it really isn't. No, it's hard. It's hard. So the solution would be to be aggressively reasonable. <laughs> well, I, I actually think you're right. Yeah. And, and this is... Uh, Absolutely. I, but, I, but this is interesting to me because I was talking to someone, I don't want to name them, because uh, about some of this identity stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were saying, well, the thing is, I don't really want to say this thing because then I, uh, then I, I, you know, then people won't hear it the same. And I actually think one of the refreshing things, one of the reasons people do watch trigonometry or watch you or whatever is we try to say things as they are without going past that and embellishing them too much. Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I, I agree with you, for example, that the idea that white people are uniquely evil and inherently bad is racist, right? Yeah. But I also don't think that we live in a society in which it's like, you know, why people are the most oppressed people ever. No, you know, it's not. Which you didn't say. No, which you it, didn't say. But, but, but there are some people who think that way yeah, and if, do if you say that. If you made it a priority, that would be a mistake. Yeah. It's not a priority. Exactly. Like, yeah. it, it, so the thing name. needs to be identified and described accurately yeah. without going overboard and without being uh, unreasonable about it in that way. Mm. So I think being determined and being unwilling to compromise are important. On, on language and certain things. Mm. But I think the enemy language is, is possibly not, th unless you, you're literally in a physical fight, in which case, absolutely, you switch the warrior on. Maybe that's uh, the linguistic term of enemies is, is what is guiding us towards a path that looks like it's gonna to lead towards civil war, mm. because we're talking about our fellow, I'm talking about our fellow countrymen. And in America, it's the same thing. It's yeah. that same pathway, it's the internal fight. Um, and maybe that isn't the way. You said uh, something interesting, Francis. Uh, you implied that the end goal was to heal the rift. Yeah, it's got to be. People aren't saying that. They're not, and they're not thinking that. And they're not moving in that direction. So that would be another element of it. It would be stay reasonable and also have that as an objective, which is we're actually trying to heal. Uh, I think it's very absolutely stated uh, yeah. in absolute terms. And, you know, I've been reading a lot of Tom Soul lately. And th this is one of the things you get is you kind of get there's no solutions, only trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're talking about is not to heal society because I don't think that's possible. People will always disagree mm -hmm. temperamentally, genetically. They have predispositions that make them different. Mm -hmm. It's about the way we have the conversation about our disagreements, mm -hmm. right? 
And does that does it have to descend into personal animosity at every opportunity? And we're all I am as, as guilty of that as anybody. You know, trolling someone online or calling Sadiq Khan a, a tyrannical dwarf, which he is. <laughs> you know, but but still, right? It's it's the tone of the conversation, I think. Rather, than, you're never going to heal society, but I think if you improve the way we communicate, that in itself would would do some healing. I, I don't mean to get religious here, but I, I will nevertheless. Um, it's when Jesus was nailed to a cross and he said the words, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And I think if you have that attitude to a lot of people who you disagree with, to a lot of people, there's always a small minority who are malevolent and spiteful. But I think with most people, they just don't consider the long-term consequences of their actions. And I think if you approach them with compassion and with understanding, you might not change their mind, but you might take a step to some type of reconciliation. Here's where I will agree with you though, in addition to what Francis said, and I agree with both of you actually. I think it's what we're talking here as well is, it's about concept creep. There are some people who you will meet in a bar and you need to stay the fuck away from them, Yeah. right? And there are other people who you could get into some kind of altercation with if you said the wrong thing and the wrong, you bumped their elbow as they're bringing their pine over. And I think it's learning to tell the difference. And I think what social media has done is it's made everyone an avatar for the guy you need to stay away from. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that's why I think you use a term like enemy because there is a small minority of people who are absolutely evil and are up to no good and they're deliberate about it. Yes. But I think they are a very small minority who need to be dealt with. But they, I think the way to deal with them is to persuade everybody else that yeah. they are unreasonable and we are the reasonable majority. So, and you can only really do that by more reasoned debate. That's it, yeah. isn't it? There's, there's nothing else than that. I think so. Yeah. Unless you've got something up your sleeve. Yeah. I really don't. I've been thinking <laughs> for ages, mate. I've got nothing. There's nothing there. And, and also, you know, I mean, again, it's kind of like, but, but be that change that you want to see in the world. If you see a world that is descending into chaos and disorder mm -hmm. and people being dysregulated and not taking responsibility, then be that person who does take responsibility. Be that person who is in control, not that we're always in control of our emotions, because we're not, because we're humans, but doing their best to control their emotions, to be reasonable, to be that adult in the room, to be that person who is a counterpoint to that behavior and say no. If you think about the best teachers that you ever had in your education, they weren't the ones who ranted and raved. They weren't the ones who, you know, who went the other way and just indulged you and let this classroom descend into chaos. They're the ones who came in who set an example, who every day did their best. And you remember them because they set an example, not the two other polar opposites. And that's, I think, what we all need to be and certainly what I'm trying to be. I may not always get there. A lot of the time I will fall and I have my own demons like we all do. But I think that's the best way to be, to try and be that person, to aspire to that. Mm. It's interesting. It, it, a lot of that, it comes back to uh, philosophy. Which is the, but the Greek, you know, Greek philosophy, you know, trying to be virtuous, trying to establish what is virtuous and aiming upward rather than allowing yourself to slide downward. Interesting. I think we, the reason that Francis and I are perhaps quite preachy about it, or we might come across that way, is doing what we do. Mm -hmm. If you think about the history of trigonometry, and you've been, in, you've dipped in at different points, mm -hmm. is we started out talking about everything that was going wrong with the world, mm -hmm. right? And we needed to do that because we needed to understand what was going on. And we had to talk to a lot of people. And so a lot of our conversations were like, you know, Francis, go, but the, isn't the problem this? And me going, well, what, a, you, you know, that was it. Yeah. But now as, as we move further, I think uh, perhaps with, as the show grows and more people watch it and whatever, we also feel like we are, we're, we're no longer bystanders. Right. We're in the game now, so yeah. to speak. What we do, who we invite, it sort of it has a small ripple. It's just a small little ripple, but but it has that ripple. And we can't pretend to ourselves that there isn't that responsibility on us. And so we're really trying to both, I think, uh, be better people so that we this opportunity that we have to bring amazing people like you on and have a discussion and not let them talk for the last 20 minutes of the interview. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But we're genuinely trying to to be constructive as people and as participants in this world that we live in, yeah. and think about less about you know who is 
been cancelled and who hasn't been allowed mm. this and that. But actually, you know, how do, how do we give opportunities to people? How do we create things? How do, you know, rather than being two comedians who set up a podcast to complain about things that needed addressing, mm. yeah. w- what are we creating exactly? Right. You know? So you've gone from being problems focused to very much more solutions focused. I think so. And And also as well, and this is a lot of work that I'm doing on myself, you know, looking at your own shadow. Because it's very easy to look outwards and point out the flaws in other people and go, this person's like this, this person's like this. Yeah, but what about you? Mm-hmm. What about what you bring to the world? Is it all good? All those, uh, the, the, the element that you have, the shadow within yourself, what work are you doing in order to try and keep that shadow under as much control as possible and to deal with it? Yeah, I suppose it's... Uh, How much do you charge for the therapy <laughs> session, Richard? It's, it's, it's <laughs> We're racking up a bill, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. we? Mate, we spend so much money on this fucking studio, we can't afford it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, it. It, uh, it, I think I have one of those faces. It might be, it might be my demeanor. No, it's the fact that we did that interview with you before where you interviewed yeah, us yeah, about yeah. all our psychological yeah, shit that no yeah. one has seen yet. So yeah. we, we feel I'll able rec- to share now. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll recover that. I yeah, will recover please. it. No, I think... Um, but I like this because... I care very much about your project. I care about what you're doing. For like I told you from the beginning, like this is this is fantastic, and um, it's nice to get in there and just check, maybe even pressure check, check. Mm-hmm. Like what's what's this? What are we doing here? What's this concept? Where are we going? And to see that there is there is something there. There's some real thought there. Like this project worked. Some people become uh, the victims of their own success, mm-hmm. but if you're still growing inside of the project or growing because of the project, that's fantastic, isn't it? Yeah. And, and, but that's the thing, it's, it, it's so important to grow. Yeah. I think that's why so many people in the society, and, and you, you look around, are miserable, because they don't grow. And that's why they go, oh, you know, the best days of my life, my life was at school. And I, number one, I find that a horrifically tragic statement. And any time yeah. someone says it, I feel deeply sorry for them. That's because you had a shit time at school, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Maybe if I was captain of the football team and going out with whatever, then maybe it would have been. But... But you go, well, the reason for that is because at school, it was constant progression. Yeah. You were going, you know, and the progression was going up every year. You were going to a new year. You were learning things. You were always moving forward. But a lot of people, when they get into adulthood, or what we discuss, what we perceive to be adulthood, they, read, they, they enter a, just a period of stasis yeah. where they don't grow, where they don't develop, where they don't improve. Yes. And as a result, they slowly atrophy. And I think that's a very real problem. Yes, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Without uh, without external pressure, people do actually. And we're living longer, and mm. the world is a more civilized place. And mm. these sound like good things, but they bring their own problems with them as well. Yeah. Of course, don't they? Like as you say, stagnation, atrophy, uh, becoming too comfortable. Mm. And I think one of the things that we all need as well is you need that challenge. You need a bit of a fight, a bit of a battle. Um, at least at the intellectual level, just to keep it fresh. Yeah. Because there must be things that, even in the last six months, that you believed to be true or you held as positions that you've let go of through yeah. chatting to people and chatting to each other. And experiences that you go through. Yeah. yeah. The experience is actually, I think, one of the bigger ones. For example, I definitely think uh, running trigonometry mm. has made me more fiscally conservative. Yeah. Because you run a small business running, in this country, you realize small, how fucking hard it is. Running a small business will do that to you. It changes you. Every time people ask me about business advice, I'm like, don't do it. You will change as a person and break in ways you cannot fucking imagine. Yeah. Yeah. It breaks you. It builds you. It's a, it's a psychedelic experience. You are a different, if you can do it, yeah. if you, because most, most people can't. They say like 80% of startups fail. It's nonsense. 99.999% fail because people can't break. They, they, they lack the mental flexibility to have the break and then come through the break and, and rebuild. Doing business from scratch is... It's I think it's been the same for imagine. you, mate, to some extent, because you've worked in public sector jobs yeah. most of your life before becoming a comedian. Uh, and now you're having to, you know, be confronted with, you know, you do this and this goes wrong and it's, yeah. your, it's on you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's... That's, that's the real challenge. And But that's what... I was talking, I was doing therapy actually, and I was talking about this and w- with my therapist and she was, we were talking about regeneration. And in many ways, if you're not regenerating a part of yourself every six months and you're not changing every six months, you're going backwards. Yeah. You've got to. 
You've got to change. Every six months, I am completely different in many ways from the person I was six months ago. Because I have to be, because my life's changed. Because things have changed. Because we're in a new location. We're, and the things that I have to implement in my life, I've got to change. Yeah. Like I've, I've someone who I've always been very anxious. And I'm doing, taking a lot of steps to work with that, to improve that. I'm learning to drive as a 40-year-old man in January. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've avoided it and, you know, done it and touched it upon it and not done it because <laughs> I found it difficult. But, well, you've got to change. Yeah, yeah. No, otherwise, yeah. Would it, otherwise, you're not going to improve. Yeah. And ultimately, we talk about kindness. But I think one of the things we never talk about with kindness is when we're not kind to ourselves. And I think that's where a lot of depression actually comes from is because when you don't do things like you don't stand up for yourself, you don't do things for yourself that you need, mm -hmm. even though you put it to the back of your mind, you know that you've let yourself down and you're not being kind to yourself. And I think a lot of it, that's where the malaise, the depression comes from because you're not being kind to yourself. And it's all of those things. Richard, so you are our last interview of the year <laughs> that we're recording. It, it may not go out in that sequence, but uh, as you think about the last year, what do you reflect on? What are your thoughts? Uh, what have you been thinking about? What is the new thing for you that you've discovered or you've kind of identified or you wanted to say? <coughs> Just a cough in our faces. Just a cough. <laughs> Just a bit of COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How are you going, mate? It's coming back. That's yeah. No, it's not. It's yeah. now the flu, mate. Yeah. <laughs> the... Uh, the thing that's been, um, well, I've never, I, I never do this whole like new year, new, new me yeah. thing, but the way 2022 has gone, especially as I'm leading up to the end of the year, it's like, wow, really a lot of old chapters in my life have closed. Mm -hmm. um, I found that as I've become more fixated in my own life, I'm more rooted in what I do want, what I do want to create, the people I want to have around me automatically and spontaneously, different situations that were there, different people that have been hanging around that shouldn't have been, they've dropped off. In my experience, of their own volition. I haven't said to them, you know, I've moved on, it's time to go away. Maybe I'm giving them a different energy or a different vibe. They just go on their own way. And one of the things that I'm thinking about a lot moving into 2023 is just to get very, very focused on what I do want, what I do want to create in my own life. And I think politically, philosophically, this country, us as a culture, we, we all have to do that now because I can see things moving potentially in a very dark direction mm -hmm. where there's going to be a lot more authoritarianism. I don't think anybody really wants it who's thought it through. In order to resist that, we must have a strong sense of what it is we do want in our lives mm -hmm. and we have to move toward it in a way that is uh, courageous and with humility, with flexibility. Um, that's what I'm going to be doing personally in 2023 is just uh, focusing on that as much. When as are you going to find a wife and have some kids, Richard? I knew he would ask me <laughs> question. Listen, fundamentally heart is Russian. Yes, Babushka yes. want to know. You must have family, yes. <laughs> Otherwise you're not real men. Not real men until I have family. No, I, I, uh, I'm sure I will eventually <laughs> this year. Not nah. going to happen. No, <laughs> not <Yeah. gonna> happen. <laughs> If I could go to Venezuela, that's when, when they let me into Venezuela, that's when I will find a uh, mujer. Por mujer vida. muy bella. Also very good if you want to lose weight, Venezuela. Is it? Oh, yeah. great. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to come back ripped, mate, because you yeah. haven't eaten anything. Dieta del weight. comunismo. Sí, sí. Exactly. <laughs> Lo mejor en el mundo. Richard, you are, uh, as I said, one of our absolute favorites. Uh, thanks so much for coming back. Thank we'll you. do a couple of questions from our supporters that only they will get to see the answer on to on locals. Did we do the last question? Have we already uh, done what, it? What's the one thing we're not talking about that we really should be? Good Lord. Everything that we've been talking about today, the, uh, the power of uh, simple, reasoned, good faith debate. I think that's, that's, uh, that's powerful. More than social activism, more than aggressively, you know, pushing people in different directions, opening up the conversation, good philosophy, embracing the Socratic method, hearing the other side, and then building our ideas together. Fantastic. If people want to get your book, where's the best place to do that? Uh, Jeff Bezos' Slave House. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you can get my book. It's I watch called... those films. <laughs> <laughs> Cult of One, it's called. Maybe um, you should knock, uh, knock that on, the, on its head for 2020. That could be a New Year resolution, mate. Stop watching that. 
Jesus Christ, that, there's an image to leave you with. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Richard Grant, and thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for watching and listening. We will see you with another brilliant episode like this one, or all show. All of them go out at 7 p.m. UK time. And for those of you who like your trigonometry on the go, it's always available as a podcast. Take care and see you soon, guys. See you on Locals, guys. Are there indications of sociopathy in the mainstream media and government?